Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Comic Book Herald Live. Hey everybody, I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of comicbookherald.com. Thanks to those of you joining live today. We are going to talk about all things comics, primarily the comic that came out today. Technically, there were two in the Destiny of X. We'll talk about those, but we got X-Men Red number eight was definitely the most exciting one. Some Al Ewing continuity Olympics in what continues to be arguably the best X-Men title. It's really just that in Immortal X-Men. I would say right now it has the edge, but I say that every week, whichever one comes out. Um, thanks for folks joining. Get in here live, get in questions, get in thoughts. We only got one book to talk about today, and then I got some topics that we can talk about as well. But if you have questions and directions you want to take things, this will definitely be a good chat to get those questions answered. Uh, Super Chat is open and available. Thanks to those in advance who can support CBH. You can always support the site and myself over at patreon.com slash comicbookherald or patreon.com slash mymarvelousyear for the My Marvelous Year Marvel Reading Club where we are starting Marvel Comics of the Year 2000 today. We've made it from 1961 to 2000 in that Marvel Comics Reading Club. Check it out if you haven't already. We're getting it. We're in the comics of this millennium, finally. Okay, comics of this millennium. Um, so yes, thank you for joining. Get in your questions, get in your thoughts. Otherwise, I am going to dive right in. Right in. Some spoilers may follow for X-Men Red number eight. This one, of course, written by Al Ewing. Um, it's good. It's a good comic. X-Men Red has continued to be really good. This one delivers on a couple threads that are pretty exciting. And I think one of the biggest things that I've been hammering and repeating consistently is a desire for creators in the X office and frankly just in big two comics to show their cards right set up mysteries set up plots that's great but you need forward narrative momentum in this game there's a lot you have to stand out against right this is true of all media of course and I think a lot of the X-Men line in particular there has been a tendency to hold the cards very close to the vest, right? And what that does repeatedly, it gives the sense that well, you don't actually have that much story to tell, right? You're hiding the one idea maybe you have. That's the impression it can give, okay? True or not, fair or not, Al Ewing is very, very good about not doing that, okay? But also building these things up over time. We have two mysteries of a sort. We have two lingering threads that come to a head here in ways that I was not necessarily anticipating. On one hand, we have the long simmering mystery of Vulcan. Gabriel Summers, the third Summers brother, maybe the fourth, depending on how we feel about Adam X the Extreme, um, who is, is a Hickman mystery. Going back to Hickman's X-Men run, there was this whole mystery of like these weird alien creatures that, that found Vulcan back when he died in War of Kings, which is a 2000, what, nine circa event. Um, that he never actually died, that they found him and implanted some mysteries in him, that Emperor Vulcan was hiding in the surface of this seemingly otherwise benign and kindly Gabriel Summers again. We get that mystery. Finally, some development on And that's one that, like, Hickman set up this really big, interesting thing. It was super surprising. It was unexpected. I didn't think he'd be going and playing War of King continuity bingo. And then, of course, Hickman's out, and it's just abandoned, and it's like, all right, does anybody get to do anything <laughs> with all this weird Vulcan stuff? And Al Ewing obviously has, has picked up that ball, right? We saw Vulcan earlier in the X-Men Red, and now we see him coming back in a big way. And then the other thread that is intersecting with the Vulcan thread is the scheme and the grand master planning of Abigail Brand. Now, Brand is the leader of S.W.O.R.D., um, has been basically allied with everyone in the X-Men sphere. Starts out clearly allying with Krakoa. Then there was the big twist that actually she's now allied with Orcus, the enemies of mutant kind. The reality, though, and I think is, is kind of unveiled here, and has been, you know, kind of been built and, and understood over time, Abigail Brand plays for herself, right? She plays for the soul system as a cosmic powerhouse with herself at the head, making sure and ensuring galactic safety, essentially, but primarily for soul. Like, that's her game. The factions, Krakoa versus Orcus, Brand does not seemingly actually have, like, a vested interest in that, okay? And then I've also got 
a theory that only became clear to me today. And I, after looking up this character's name um, to figure out, like, oh, am I onto something here? I realized this is something that folks have been talking about for probably a few months now, if not longer, uh, depending on the <laughs> the X Men theory thread circles that you run in. I don't really pay attention to that stuff, but obviously, I like to like to come up with my own here. And Dave Stinney has a prediction. It's a lead pipe lock. It, it's a hundred percent. I guarantee it's going to happen to do with Mister Sinister and what's going on in X Men Red. Okay, so we're going to talk about that as well because I think it's a it's a fun really interesting angle that I had not considered before today. And today it felt like really obvious. It's one of those things where when you hear it, you're like, oh yeah. Okay. That's happening. That's cool. That's exciting. Um, but again, like big picture, big picture, I think Al Ewing's cosmic landscape across the Marvel universe is incredibly exciting. It is also incredibly fractured. You know, you have to read a lot of titles a lot of different series names for all the pieces to add up. Like just today in X-Men Red number eight, Ewing's playing off of late stage Guardians, his like 15, 16 issue run he did semi-recently. Okay, Guardians of the Galaxy. He's playing off of the concept of the progenitors, not to be confused with Judgment Day's progenitor, which we just spent a summer event dealing with. The progenitors are like basically his celestials of a sort, very Kirby influence. That's from the super slept on 2017 Royals series in an Inhumans book that he did. Um, and then, of course, he's pulling on all sorts of X-Men continuity that he has had a hand in now through X-Men Red, through Sword, and then dating back to like some of the Hickman stuff um, in X-Men, right? And there's probably even more than that, I would imagine. There tends to be, right? And then just like Marvel history stuff, Ewing's doing continuity Olympics, you know, and it's one of those things where if you're playing along and you're as obsessed with Marvel Comics continuity and the details of all that has happened as I am, it's incredibly rewarding. Like the stories are fun and, and like, you know, very, very inventive and thoughtful, but they also get a huge, huge bonus and boost because of the continuity that is leveraged, right? Because of the fact that it's playing off the things that we read before, it's a value add that you just don't get in other media, you know? Like like in serialized storytelling, because comics are so sprawling and there's so many of them and the history is so long and fragmented and fractured, when you get those boosts of like continuity dopamine, you know, it's pretty cool when a creator can do that. And Ewing has an incredible history at this point. Uh, I mean, nobody nobody does it better at Marvel right now for the last several years. I think Jed McKay, like, has a, has a chance to, like, you know, potentially get there one day, does a nice job with that stuff. But Al Ewing's absolutely the master. I don't think anyone at DC is probably particularly close, although I'm not incredibly invested in DC, like, ongoing stuff at the moment. Um, and honestly, when you go through, like, Marvel history and you think about the continuity wonks, you know, you got, like, Mark Grunewald uh, was definitely hailed as such. Oftentimes, they are are player coaches where they're editors and writers, right? And they're kind of wearing both hats and doing both things. And as a result, they are like super immersed in the lore. Ewing's just telling stories, right? Just telling stories and they're all all very good. Um, so anyway, long story short, X-Men Red, of course is very good, but I, I can see like if this is your first, like if you started with X-Men Red, right? Um, and you were like, all right, I'm going to jump into this X-Men book, I do think, yeah, probably you're missing out on some of the... Not that, like, it's incomprehensible necessarily, but it probably doesn't feel as tight or as well thought out. Um, there is a page, you know, it's a data page at the very end of this, of Abigail Brand explaining her plan, and it is exposition, you know, but it is also, like, it's almost like depressingly spelled out, <laughs> you know? Like, it literally is like a summary of everything that has happened here. And it is spelled out in such specificity that I was actually like, like, there's not a lot of value added here if you've been playing along. If you needed that recap, I suppose it's useful. Um, 
And, and, and this isn't like, and it sounds a little snobbish to be like, oh, if you needed it, <laughs> right? There's things on there I've forgotten that I think were interesting. Um, but just sort of spelling out like, here's everything that happened to make my story make sense. Uh, I don't know. It wasn't as cool as I wanted it to be. Like it, it wasn't like, oh, Bran's been playing the long game and, and look how it all came together so much. It was just like, and here's a synopsis of everything you've already read. Um, okay, so that's a, a long enough way of talking around what is Abigail Brand's ultimate plan here. Uh, the Krakoans, um, Cable, Wizkid, Manifold, folks that were with Brand on Sword have all kind of come together at this point and, and said post-Abigail Brand needing to get resurrected. Because I think she dies when Uranus attacks during Judgment Day. And... Um, and during that resurrection, it gave them the opportunity to kind of see what some of her plans are. And they're basically like, okay, Brand is scheming against us. And at a minimum, they learn that, uh, you know, she's working with Orcus, right? So the tide's turning against Brand in that regard. It seems like they're catching up and finally, get, you know, catching on to her. <coughs> Pardon me. And, uh, and as that's happening... Brand is simultaneously scheming for her ultimate goal, which is a galaxy where sword operates as shield of the entire galaxy. This is a really interesting position, I think, for Ewing to put Brand in, because generally speaking, in the grand Marvel tapestry of Marvel Cosmic, Earth and, and the Soul System are not a major player, you know? And it's, it's a kind of a trope in sci-fi that, like, Earth is this backwater planet that many other civilizations are way more advanced. And that's certainly been true in Marvel Cosmic history, right? The Shi'ar are an empire. The Kree Skrull are an empire, you know, that spans galaxies. Earth is just Earth, <laughs> you know? So for the soul system to be in charge... <coughs> excuse me, to be sort of dictating things. That is, it doesn't make sense on paper, you know? So Bran has to make it make sense. And that's what's been happening. That's what's been happening. I mean, that was the whole thing with gathering this Mysterium, with creating tremendous wealth that could only be accessed via, you know, Krakoa and Arako and the Soul System, and what Brand is also now angling to do through the coolest reveal here, which is that she has essentially taken, like, like Brand is in part behind Vulcan's now descent into Emperor Vulcan. She has a major hand in that, and we'll talk about that. Um, but now she's weaponizing Vulcan, releasing Emperor Vulcan to basically incite civil war, amongst the Shi'ar, and possibly fracture kind of war between the Kree, Skrull, and then the Shi'ar, right? So she is basically saying, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to put everyone else to war, and then Soul's going to have the opportunity to step in and be the mediator. One second. Got the old, uh, the old cough back again from the, from the kiddos. We'll see if I can make it through a stream here. We will try. Get in your questions, like I said. <coughs> I want to address as many as I can. Same question here, would it be bad if Soul was in charge? I don't know about bad. It's simply unusual. Um, and it's, I mean, the thing here about Brand is like, okay, Brand is master planning for a, sh a shield of the stars position for the entire galaxy for S.W.O.R.D. And that's not inherently a bad thing necessarily, 
but Brand is sort of portrayed as this kind of Machiavellian villain, I think primarily because, you know, you know what they say about absolute power, right? It corrupts absolutely. And, um, and Brand does not want to be accountable or really working with anyone else. Like, like Brand is not in league with anyone other than herself. So if you look at Koa and some of the problems of leadership they've had, where the Quiet Council is not accountable in a lot of ways to the rest of the island, right? Or then you have Moira, Mags, and Professor X not accountable even to the rest of the Quiet Council, right? And, and the more you're dealing in secrets and solitary decision-making, the more things tend to go awry, I think, generally speaking. Um, and, and that's definitely what I think Brand is set up for here in so many ways is, you know, can she make every decision <laughs> perfectly for the galaxy? And I, I guess the villainous part of this that I kind of glossed over there, <laughs> which should not, probably not be, is setting up intentionally civil war and all the lives that are going to be lost in that in order to consolidate your strategic vision for power, that is categorically a bad thing. <laughs> so, so the means of getting there uh, is, is absolutely a problem, I think. Okay, I think most of us can agree. <laughs> most of us can agree. Um, is Bran going to succeed in this? Uh, I kind of... I think it's kind of more interesting if she does in some ways, frankly. Um, but I'm also not super hooked on that idea. I, I don't have a lot of confidence that that's going to happen. Okay. Um, we can talk about why. So, okay. So the big, the big, you know, chess move that, that allows Bran to declare checkmate here in her master plan and destabilizing the galaxy is to release this weaponized Vulcan. To release angry Gabriel Summers, the former emperor of the Shi'ar, trying to reclaim his his throne from Xandra, who is otherwise incredibly thoughtful, compassionate leader, or at least appears to be at this young age. Um, Xandra's overhearing, you know, crimes the Shi'ar perpetrated against the Skrulls specifically, and is basically like, we will, we will make this right. We will make restitution. And they're kind of having that conversation. The Skrulls are like, do you know what that entails? Because like so many of us died because of this. Um, and uh, Xandra's like, you know, she is compassionate. She's a compassionate leader. Vulcan, Emperor Vulcan is the opposite of that. Now, if you've been reading, you know, kind of since House of Powers, you know Gabriel Summers is this sort of like near-do-well alcoholic Summers brother. <laughs> kind of seems just like a, a fun hang at the grill. If you've read Vulcan's history from Deadly Genesis through the rise and fall of the Shi'ar Empire, and then, of course, Emperor Vulcan and War of Kings. Dude is Maximus the Mad, but with more power, you know? Um, you know, he's a tyrant. He's awful. He is, like, the worst, you know, stereotypical Roman emperor kind of person, right? Vulcan sucks, <laughs> and he's incredibly powerful. Um, but he is... He's all about conquest. He's all about rage. He doesn't care who gets hurt in the process. You know, um, he may be semi-effective as a leader of the Shi'ar in terms of attempting conquest, but all anger, all rage all the time. So for him to take back over, like, that's a bad thing for the galaxy. That's a bad thing for the Shi'ar, generally. And it's obviously a bad thing for, um, well, I don't know. I was going to say for, for Krakoa's position in the galaxy, but maybe it's not. I don't know, because it, it kind of is part of, kind of part of Bran's plan, but kind of not. You know, so you, when you see it in Bran's phase five, like, Bran is expecting that, okay, let's say Vulcan, you know, kills Andra or initiates this civil war or whatever. Um, the X-Men are going to feel guilty about that, basically, right? Like, they are, they're going to feel like Vulcan is a problem they need to solve. They're going to have to do something about it. Um, and then that's going to position, you know, like, I don't, I don't think Bran's plan is inclusive of Vulcan, like staying on the throne of the Shi'ar. Okay. But the most interesting part about all this, again, is that like Brand anticipated the possibility of Vulcan still being alive 
which is a weird one. Um, and then was able to work with this mysterious Orbis Stellaris, who is a character that's been kind of quietly and, and felt, I, I don't know if it was like a character or an organization, um, you know, initially, but I think it's just a character. It's been kind of quietly introduced through Sword and X-Men Red. We saw during that sequence, which felt like kind of a weird throwaway, um, where the, the cloned Lethal Legion is sent in to try to assassinate Xandra, uh, that was an Orbis Stellaris production. Okay. So it's been kind of this weird new galactic player, and what I realized today, or what we all realized today in X-Men Red, is, okay, Orbis Stellaris cloned, or didn't clone, but, like, worked on Vulcan. Like, that's where the work was done to put in this... Um, you know, like, basically to make Vulcan, basically to set up Vulcan as a Trojan horse. Like, to send him back to Krakoa seemingly peaceably, and then to, um, you know, have the Emperor Vulcan dormant within. That's an Orbis Stellaris production. Okay? The other thing is that we know some of Cable's techno-organic arm was sent to Orbis Stellaris for uh, cloning and experimentation. It was revealed today, I don't know that this has ever been shown before, that Cable can, like, control, so, like, he can control his techno-organic thing, you know, he makes Wolverine claws with it, but he talks about it as part of the Technarch, which is where Warlock's from. <coughs> I don't remember that being confirmed before, which, you know, because of the connections between the Technarch and the Phalanx and all that stuff, makes that potentially pretty interesting. I think. Small detail, but I feel like potentially very meaningful. Um, but the thing that, like, okay, Brand is working with Orvis Stellaris here. They kind of implanted Vulcan as this Trojan horse. Now they're releasing the monster at a Galactic Council to set things off. That's all pretty interesting. You know, I was not connecting those dots in that way, certainly. Um, the other thing that I, that's why I was connecting, connecting until today and this is, again, this is a Dave Sydney prediction, but I feel like it's a spoiler. Like, it's such a lock that I feel like it's a spoiler <laughs> for what's to come. So, like, skip ahead a minute if you don't want to hear it. Um, Orbis Stellaris is for sure another Mr. Sinister. <laughs> like, absolute lock, Orbis Stellaris is a Mr. Sinister. We saw this happen already in the Jerry Duggan written X-Men. Um where Dr. Stasis was revealed to be the sinister of, what is he, clubs? He started treating the diamond like a card suit. <laughs> okay. Um, I guarantee that's what's happening here as well. We've got a mysterious entity obsessed with cloning, a last name that ends in S, um, is experimenting on Summers specifically, Sinister has always been obsessed with the Summer Smaldine. I think this is our Sinister clone of space. <coughs> I love pulling in clone Sinisters making their own schemes throughout a variety of X-Men titles. That's great. That's super smart. Um, it has not been revealed yet, you know, but I expect it's coming maybe in next month's X-Men Red number nine right before the Sins of Sinister, I think would be a pretty a pretty sensible place to unveil that. So on, on December 7th right now, there's a Mortal X-Men and X-Men Red are both scheduled to come out. So we're going to get a dual Best X-Men Books Day. And I am predicting that we will see the reveal of this Orbis Stellaris character as a Sinister of whatever suit is not used right now. Spades? <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Um, I'm locking it in. What do you all think? Get in your thoughts. I'm going to run through the comments here and see what it is everybody's talking about. See an Orbis Delar Sinister mention there, probably right as I started talking about it. Um... Gillen didn't name the Celestial Progenitor. Jack Kirby did. Yes, that's correct. Uh, 
you know, there was already a celestial progenitor, and then Ewing made it weird by making the progenitors. <laughs> no, no question. Sinisters for everyone, absolutely. Let's see. Orbis being a sinister makes sense since Sinister is in charge of the timeline with the Moiras right now. Yeah. Uh, I'm seeing James here say, I would love to see the fourth Sinister pop up as a villain in a non-X title. I could definitely see Zeb Wells running with that. Obviously, having written such a great Sinister in Hellions, having Dark Web going on right now with clones and Madeline Pryor coming up, that would make infinite sense. If not that, I think I'd most like to see just like a completely unrelated book where the fourth Sinister... Like, the, like having the fourth Sinister be the super ineffective bad schemer, you know, with a plan that, like, just, like, was incredibly useless, <laughs> you know? Like, what's, like, the most disconnected Marvel book right now? Just, like, doing its own thing, you know? Like, does Marvel have fun comics anymore? <laughs> Is that a thing? Like, we went through such a good era of just kind of like, I don't know, like Howard the Duck ongoings and Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur and Miss Marvel was good for a good long time. Um, like, what are the goofball off the beaten path Marvel books at this point? I don't even know. I don't even know. I mean, they're probably all minis, you know, but whatever. Put Sinister there. Put the fourth Sinister there. I'm into it. Let's see. Folks are saying they think it's right. Yeah, I mean, once you think about it, it's just like it all checks out. All the pieces are there. It would honestly be disappointing if it wasn't the case. You know, like if that didn't happen, it would be like, oh, OK, Orbis Stellaris, whatever. <laughs> like, I don't care <laughs> about that person, but I care about Mr. Sinister and all the clones right now. Um, it just makes so much sense. And I think it would be incredibly fun. Sure, put the Sinister Hearts in Exterminators. Yeah, that's a good one. Right? Just like all the other Sinisters are like, you know, we've got plans for Orcus to take over society, and we've got plans for uh, all this cloning in space and whatever the heck's going on there with Brand. Um, obviously, we got the main Sinister doing all this Moira stuff. And then put a fourth Sinister who's just like, yeah, I put some vampires on roller skates. <laughs> like, yeah, I've got, a, I've got a grindhouse thing going on here. Um, you know, hot axe babes come and fight the vampires. <laughs> Just something like totally innocuous and generally meaningless. Uh, that would be fun. I'm into it. Into it. What happens to Bran when her plans as a traitor go public? Odds of that happening. Question here from Brandon. Well, I guess that's the thing. Is Bran's scheme does rely on Krakoa not knowing it was her, because she wants them to go along with it, as well as, um, you know, eventually, like, the Avengers and the like, sort of respecting her a la Nick Fury in order to get them to, um, uh, what do you call it, like, you know, back her plan and sort of initiate galactic stability again after all the Korean scroll and Shi'ar shenanigans and war wars and such. Um... So, yeah, they kind of can't know. And right now, too many people know. But Bran seems to know that they know. I think. I don't know. I'm not 100% on that one, I guess. I don't really think about that. Like, does Bran definitely know that Cable and Manifold and Wizkid know what she's doing? Maybe she doesn't, actually. It's a possibility. If she doesn't know, that's that's, I guess that's the undoing here. Right? That's the way this definitely gets undone. Then if they reveal everything. Is the new Secret Invasion mini supposed to be important? Uh, I kind of doubt it, but it is written by Ryan North, who's really good. And I'm going to be writing Fantastic Four soon, so it could be really interesting. I haven't read it yet. But, you know, I'm semi, semi-interested. Important feels like a stretch. I mean, it feels probably more like it's supposed to tie in vaguely to... The fact that Disney Plus is going to have a Secret Invasion series. Like, I don't think we're going back to, you know, Secret Invasion 2. Um, although certainly that's always a possibility. Secret Invasion is... It's kind of underrated, I think. Like, it's not a good event. 
But the build-up to Secret Invasion ruled. The build-up to Secret Invasion was really good, and then the fallout was really good as well with Dark Rain. But the event itself was kind of a mess. Do you throw Brand in the pit? I don't know. Is the pit still viable? I'm really unclear on the status of the pit. Post Sabretooth. I need uh, I need Sabretooth and the Exiles to explain whether or not we're still throwing anybody in the pit. So that comes out next Wednesday. The first issue of the follow-up to Sabretooth, written by Victor Laval. I'm going to have Laval on for an interview that Saturday. So that'll be a lot of fun. Gets to talk about the kickoff of the second series, the fact that the first series was so good. I'm excited about that. <laughs> yeah, I love the build-up in New Avengers. The Bendis era in New Avengers, when it was all like mystery about, oh, who's the power player who's secretly running things. I love that. The payoff wasn't what you wanted, <laughs> necessarily. Um, but again, I will wrap for the early days Bendis New Avengers any day of the week, for sure. Bill asks, have you listened to Kieran's interview? Uh, the answer is no. Um, but it says he's giving Immortal X-Men number nine as a focus on Kate and her Marauder's journey while understanding the meaning of Hellfire. Sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, every every issue is a new, a new focus. I think Immortal X-Men number eight is going to be Mystiques, it looked like, from the cover. Um... I do need to, before I do my, my interview with Monsieur Gillen, uh, which is going to be, it's now pushed back. I've got some scheduling things. So it's now going to happen on November 20th. i be interviewing Gillen about Immortal X-Men and Judgment Day and all that fun stuff. Um, I need to check out his podcast, Decompressed, a little bit more. If you haven't done that, I listened to an interview he did with uh, Tom Humberstone, actually, who's a creator that I got to interview as well. Um, but he has an interview with Hickman from a few years back that I'm kind of curious to go check out. I listened to Decompress when it was first coming out in like 2013, 2014. It's just like creator conversations. It's interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. <coughs> Did you see the FCBD announcement? Captain Krakoa on a new Uncanny Avengers. Here's the thing about Unity squads in this era. Uh, don't need it. <laughs> don't need it. Um, now, if Captain Krakoa is Steve Rogers culturally appropriating Krakoa, I will read that book. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's kind of that's kind of aligned with what I've been saying for you know the past year now, which is. The center of the Marvel Universe has been moving more and more to Krakoa since House and Powers. Right? With every passing year, the center of the Marvel Universe moves closer and closer to a Krakoa-driven universe. So the fact that you'd want, again, to tie the Avengers to that, you know, it's like, it's like okay, what's coming in Dark Web? Okay, we're going to get Spider-Man tied to a Madeline Pryor story, tied to mutant stuff. You know, we're going to move towards the mutants. What's Judgment Day? The, the Eternals... Avengers event. Oh, well, it's, you know, it's going to be war on Krakoa. Okay, so we're moving the Marvel Universe closer to Krakoa. We put Captain Krakoa on Avengers team. Again, we're moving everything that is supposed to be at the center of the core of this universe. Everything's moving closer to Krakoa and mutant stories. Marvel's not wrong. I mean, they're, they're, their most interesting thing right now is that setup, is these comics. It is absolutely the most interesting central possible tenant of what this universe is and can be. Um, plus, the kinds of stories that, you know, the X-Men creators want to tell and that Hickman set up, they all kind of deal with the fate of the Marvel Universe. And they, you know, even look at what Ewing's doing in X-Men Red, right? They deal with the status of Earth as the center of the galaxy kind of stuff. It's hard to do that and not have the other books feel that weight, right? If Orcus comes and puts their full weight to bear on ridding Earth of, of Krakoa in Fall of X... You know, I think the way we expect that event to go, um, that's stuff that is going to involve and impact the rest of Marvel Comics, right? So everything is leaning mutant, everything is leaning X-Men, everything is leaning Krakoa. That's going to be the center of the Marvel Universe until 
Krakoa is no longer on Earth. You know, which could be something that comes out of Fault of X. Right? Um, I liked Uncanny Avengers uh, in, in its way in Marvel Now. Not necessarily as a, like... I don't know that it was a super interesting X-Men Avengers crossover, but I, I liked the Reminder stuff with Kang and the Apocalypse Twins and the Celestials. Until Axis hit and was like a giant dud. Um, I actually do like Uncanny Avengers as, you know, the spiritual successor to Uncanny X-Force, which is a run that I love. Uh, I think the follow-up Uncanny Avengers, which I think was written by Jerry Duggan, um, there's some Pepe Laraz stuff in there, Duggan and Laraz actually, which is, you know, cool to go back and look at. It's fine. Like, it's meat and potatoes superhero stuff. You know, you're not, you're not missing anything super, super important. Um... So, yeah, I don't know. It's like anything. It's like the hands of the creator are going to matter. I mean, I'm at this point, I'm more interested in Avenger, an Avengers book that has Captain Krakoa on it. You know what I mean? Like, like Avengers need some mutant boosts. Mutants don't need Avengers boosts right now. This is not like a universal theory. <laughs> this is not like X-Men versus Avengers stuff. This is, right now, Avengers comics are... I'm not interested. I am checked out. <laughs> so to regain interest and make them interesting again, yeah, you insert some mutant flavor in there and see what happens. Uh, it does make sense with where the universe is at right now. Let's see. Um, it says the FC, FCBD cover features just mutants with Captain America. Sure. I mean, Cap should have some fandom here towards Krakoa. He was resurrected. And they gave him his shield in the egg. How cool is that? Right? So, I mean, yeah, it makes sense. Um, and again, all this stuff is going to be like, who's writing the book? You know, what's the creative team involved? And, it, I mean, I, I got to say, like, I again, I'm not like super anti anyone, um, but I do hope it's not Duggan because Duggan's done that before. And like I just said, it was meat and potatoes. It was fine. Uh, we do not need more of that. But definitely put some new creators on it with an interesting angle. And, you know, I could see it being cool. I was actually thinking the other day, you know, kind of as I prepped for this Karen Gillen interview, like, there's a couple things Gillen hasn't done at Marvel. You know, more than two. But there's three, I would say, that are interesting. Spider-Man. Avengers. And either Fantastic Four or Guardians, a team. Hasn't written any of those. And I was trying to think about which one I would actually be the most excited about. And it's probably Spider-Man. Just because I, I, the idea of like a singular creator with a vision owning Spidey is probably just inherently more exciting to me than, than any other franchise. But a Gilded Avengers could be interesting too. Especially given everything we've seen with Immortal, given everything we saw with the turnover for Eternals, I feel like he's in a really interesting point in his career where that could be like the lift that that franchise needs after just like the quagmire of the Jason Aaron era. You know? But I don't know. What do y'all think? Well, what would you want to see Gillen take on? I mean, I guess really the answer is please just stay with X-Men for like two years. <laughs> I guess, you know, obviously that's the thing before we start talking about anything else. But if you had to do it, if you had to do it, what would it be? Let's see. What other questions we got? What plans might the Quiet Council be making given the Moira future info? We, I mean, here's the thing. The sad reality. We don't really talk about Moira. <laughs> like, we just don't really talk about it. Um, she shows up as a mean robot sometimes now with Orcus. But yeah, like no interesting conversations are ever had. So I'm not giving the Quiet Council any respect on their name or consideration of what Moira might be doing because there's been no appearance that that is a thing that is happening. <laughs> you know, which is a bummer, I think. Um... Let's see, Xavier says, 
I can't let you talk about Cap's egg shield. Proteus can create whatever. He makes adamantium for Wolverine nonstop, and no one cares. Doesn't... Isn't the adamantium like a Forge creation? Wasn't there something we saw where Forge makes, like, adamantium baths? Maybe Proteus pulls from that? I don't know. I mean, honestly, realistically, sure. I don't care. I'm not... I mean, I talked about this previously, like... <coughs> Cap coming out of the egg with the shield is way funnier and way more fun <laughs> than the alternative. I don't care if it makes sense. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that explanation. How did it happen? Ah, uh, Proteus, I guess. <laughs> you can basically do anything. Okay, sure. Uh, I'm seeing here, give Ewing Avengers. See, I'm actually kind of opposed to that. I'm actually kind of out on that. Uh, Al Ewing has done Avengers. A lot, actually. Mighty Avengers. Um, uh, Avengers. What was that thing he did with Wade and, and Jim Zub? Um, the weekly one. No Surrender. Right? I actually think the Al Ewing Avenger stuff is his weakest Marvel output. For my money. Every Avengers book he has touched. Did he do U.S. Avengers? Was that a thing? Every Avengers book he has touched has, has been the weakest, actually, I think. But you know what, what would be really cool? And again, give it a couple years. Al Ewing Justice League. DC. Make an offer. Make an offer, you know? I also I actually think Legion of Superheroes would be the best possible pick on the DC side. Um, but I actually think an Al Ewing Justice League would be flippin' fascinating. And, like, kind of the thing that that universe needs. You know how, like, there was the big Bendis is coming <laughs> moment with DC? We just read a few interesting articles about this on Comic Herald. Um, I feel like if Al Ewing went to DC, it would actually have that impact. Because DC came to Bendis, like... I mean, like a decade too late, you know. Um, and I actually think about it is that, first off, I was doing interesting creator own work still, for sure. I think his superhero stuff is kind of plateaued. Um, so not really even picking on Bendis so much as just like, they got there way late. If you got the Al Ewing right now, like you're actually getting somebody in their prime, you know. You're the Bulls getting to Rosen if you get Al Ewing on Justice League. And obviously that's going to, brighten up your day <laughs> if you're a good old DC fan uh, but yeah I don't like Al Ewing Avengers and I'm not afraid to say it I don't, I don't know if I'll find any pushback on that but it has never really worked for me let's see I wonder if they did anything to Cap when they brought him back Tad says I like this question I like this line of thinking. It's been a long time since it, we really had those post hoc pox conversations about like, hey, are like, you know, like egg resurrectors being tracked? Are they being mentally manipulated? Are they being pacified in some way? You could do something there with Cap, right? I don't know who's doing it at this point, but you could do something there. <laughs> DC getting Bendis was the Sixers getting PJ Tucker. <laughs> That's harsh. That's harsh. <laughs> Good one. I don't think it's that bad. Bendis' is Superman was hot for a minute. It really was. That's That action comics run started off strong. It started off strong. Um, what else did Bendis do with DC? Uh, oh, Batman Universe is really good. Batman Universe is actually really good. Here's the thing. Batman Universe hits several threes a game. PJ Tucker could never. <laughs> could never. I like the NBA ref, though. Uh, Dave, what do you think is the new team book appearing in the Free Comic Book Day 2023 Avengers X-Men? Okay, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, sounds like from what people are pitching here that it's going to be an uncanny Avengers thing. Um, I, I would like to see them rename, I guess, you know, like, like why can't, why do the X-Men have to join the Avengers, especially since it's an X-Men universe? Why can't it be just like, oh, well, it's going to be X-Men, but Captain America is going to be with them, you know, 
or like, hey, it's X Force. Here's uh, here's Iron Man. I don't know. I I do. I guess I have that sort of nerd barrier thing of like crossing streams isn't. It's just not right <laughs> in some ways, you know. Should Avengers and X Men be on the same books together? Um, but I mean, it sounds like that's the direction we're heading. Which again, that's the that's the bent of the Marvel universe right now. Are the data pages just that, or is someone reading them that hasn't been revealed yet? I mean, initially it felt like a really cool theory that it was all like part of Moira's analysis, or like it was part of you know the powers of ten Nimrod library stuff. I mean, at this point, they just feel like data pages, like. <laughs> like the mystery and the intrigue has been lost. Um, somebody later could say they're a part of something. Obviously you could always pull that trigger at some point, but at this point I think it's lost. It's lost. It's luster. Is it wrong to say Marvel in these times needs someone like Ewing? No, it's not wrong to say that. I mean, every, literally every publisher <laughs> needs, needs top tier creators. Um, and how Ewing is that for Marvel and has been for like six years now, you know? So, I mean, no, like, I think Ewing's a great fit at Marvel and has built like a personal continuity, you know, like, like certain creators when they have success and they have a lengthy run at a publisher, they build their own mini universes. Like there's an Al Ewing Marvel universe, you know, there's Jonathan Hickman Marvel universe. Um, there's, I don't know, even like a Rick Remender Marvel Universe, you know, like we were talking about earlier. Um, so there's, there's value in him staying, I think. But yeah, I mean, if I'm Marvel and I hear DC made an offer to Al Ewing to write Justice League, you know, it's like, what number do you need? We will match that. Like, it's not even a conversation. I, I you know, they, if they lose Ewing or productivity from Ewing, you know, that's a huge blow. That's a huge blow to them, just in terms of, like, big ideas and incredibly consistent comics. Um, let's see. I see here from Xavier, Naomi is really bad. <laughs> Naomi was pretty good. And did so well that it, like, immediately got a show. <laughs> that was a Bendis project with uh, David Walker, who's really good. Um, that series started out fine. I haven't been invested since, but that was that was a success. Like, no questions asked. Let's see. Nerd barrier detected. Yes, that will happen. That will happen. Brayden asks, think it'll be much longer till the Reed, <laughs> Reed Fantastic Four X-Men payoff. I think everything's, you know, like, listen, like we got, we're getting one seed that was planted, developed here with Vulcan and, uh, and Abigail Brand. Like, just enjoy one thing actually coming to fruition. Because virtually everything else, like this, this office wants to play the longest of games. They just do. Um, so yes, I think it'll be a while longer. Is the Krakoa era the most divisive era ever? Oh, I don't think so. It is the most, it is the most fan enthusiasm I've ever seen in comics. Now listen, like my comics awareness starts circa like 2010. Okay. So, you know, I was not there when 52 was coming out weekly or, uh, Grant Morrison joined new X-Men or whatever. Right. So could there be moments, or, you know, I was not at comic shops when, when Rob Liefeld and Jim Lee and Tom McFarlane were putting lines around the block. Right. So like, yes, I know fan enthusiasm has manifested in sales certainly more effectively. I'm talking about in the era that I've cared about comics and run a comic book website and been talking about them a ton, I have never seen greater fan enthusiasm and interest and excitement than House of X and Powers 10. So to, and I, like, I kind of know what you mean about like, oh, is it divisive? Because like some fans are really angry about this era and obviously like as it has grown a little long in the tooth and not delivered in the ways that it's felt like it could, you know, it's a little more convenient and easier to sort of hop on that train. Um, but the most divisive era ever, absolutely not. I mean, oh my gosh, it's the, it's the most successful X-Men has been 
since I don't know when. Um, and again, just in terms of like reception and fandom and interest, the most I've ever seen, which is cool. And, I, you know, it's funny. For my model this year, we're reading Apocalypse the Twelve which is an event that came out in 2000. Y'all, we have it pretty good. <laughs> like, comics right now, if you read the Krakauer comics, we have it pretty good. Don't believe me? Go read some 1999 and 2000 X-Men. Okay? Run on back. We have it pretty good. X-Men Red is a lot better. Is a lot better. I'm seeing Xavier say, the world is divisive, but the comics are good. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a fair way to put it. I think that is a fair way to put it. There seems to be a large group of people that absolutely hate it. I mean, one of the things that is tricky that you got to peg down is, is there a large group of people that hate it? Or is there, like, what platform are you on? <laughs> like, YouTube might make it look that way, right? Um, YouTube benefits from rage hate. You know, that is, like, again, like, I've talked about this in the past, like, it... In the wake of She-Hulk, the first episode, if you search for She-Hulk, the first 10 episodes were, or the first 10 videos recommended that weren't like trailers were everyone talking about it being the worst thing ever, about Marvel being so woke and that being a problem, and just all these things that were just created to generate a prepared response based on certain trigger words. Okay? You know, that it's woke, that it's, that it's liberal. That it's, that it's uh, feminism, okay? If you actually go out in the world <laughs> and talk to people, how oh, would you think of She-Hulk? A majority of folks will be like, oh, yeah, pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> right? This is nothing new. We all kind of intuitively understand this, whether we're sucked into it or not. But, like, the platform you're looking at and the perspective you're getting, um, it, they color. Like, they, they collaborate. They feed into each other. I think more often than not in negative ways. I mean, I was, I've been guilty of this in my life, and I'm certainly can be, you know, in terms of like Twitter, right? You go on Twitter and it's like, oh, everyone's mad about this thing. You know, that must be the perception of this book. It's like, no, that's like, like 10 people <laughs> online, uh, you know, and it's, it's not the same thing as like, if you go into a comic shop, what are people actually talking about? Um, obviously everyone is aware of stuff like this, but, uh, but no, but no. Think, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's a vocal minority. Again, I don't know really, but I'm just telling you, is it the most, when you compare it to like history of comics, right? Krakoa is not that divisive. Um, I mean, I was, something as, as, as innocuous seeming as like Dan Slott retconning Franklin Richards, like that's more divisive, <laughs> you know? Like that's a, that to me has more like unanimous, like fan vitriol. Um, Superior Spider-Man, actually, if we're going to keep it on the slot train, that was probably more divisive. That was a, people are sending this creator death threats moment, which is insane and awful and should never happen. But that's what happened. Yeah, I'm saying I like She-Hulk. It, it's not, I mean, it's not a referendum on that, right? But it's like, first off, it, it ended really well. The last three episodes were strong. Um, Zeb Wells wrote an episode. Cody Ziegler wrote an episode. You get a couple comics folks in there. They did a nice job. And I love the, the meta stuff in the last episode. I thought that was really, really effective and well done. Um, but it's not, I mean, again, end of the day, it's like, I, I don't love that series. I think it's okay. It's more or less in the middle for me in terms of like MCU power rankings. Um, but again, that, that idea that like, you know, somebody's first search be like, Oh, what are people saying about this? And like, there's 10 YouTube videos that are like, it's the worst thing ever. Marvel has collapsed. This is proof that Marvel's dead. You know, it's like, it is so, so heavy handed and leaning towards Stuff that has nothing to do with Shield, frankly, or the content or the quality, right? It's all about just like what are the preconceived, pre-established perspectives that we think our audience has that is going that we're going to froth up, you know, in that moment. Uh, okay, let me just put the soapbox down here, and all right, soapbox down. Here we go. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't think of Kirko as divisive at all. I guess, like, how could? something so unanimously good <laughs> be, be that divisive. Let's see. All right. I'll answer like two more questions. I'm going to go. Get in your questions here. I will address what I can. Uh, 
Oh, I get, you know, I haven't actually mentioned um, Deadpool number one launched today. And apparently it's just straight up part of the X line now. Like I knew it was managed out of the same office and I think Jordan D. White edits it. And it's written by Alyssa Wong, who's going to have a role and Deadpool's on X-Force now. But I didn't realize it was just like straight up an X book now, um, which is what they're counting it as. Now, if you read it, like there's not really any X-Men related stuff. Uh, but I guess we're counting Deadpool and the Destiny of X now, which, okay. Um... Oh, and there was, I guess, Harrower, the villain in this, is related to horde culture. <laughs> if you've read the uh, Steve Orlando mini uh, about Man-Thing, uh, that's where Harrower's from, and horde culture. But, uh, yeah, it was a fine first issue. I enjoyed Deadpool as an assassin. I like the idea of Deadpool needs to kill. I don't, it's doing big Marvel Universe stuff. I'm definitely not the target audience for a Deadpool book at this point in time. Um, so I'd be curious what other people thought about that, but I was, I was pretty nonplussed as a first issue and sort of as a consideration of like, okay, if we're doing Deadpool and the Destiny of X, what does that mean? Um, I might check out the next couple issues, but like, I'm definitely not gonna, I don't know. It didn't, it definitely didn't hook me in such a way where I was like, oh, sweet. This is good now. You know, I wasn't crazy about that. <coughs> Let's see. Okay. Last questions. All right. What do we got here? Um, I heard the sentence Marvel is dead so many times. Marvel is owned by Disney. They're producing the largest movies in the world. <laughs> I think they're going to be okay. I think they're going to be okay. You probably save your tears from Marvel. Uh, one comic YouTuber specifically with a decent following complains about the Krakoa era every chance he gets. It feels like forced hate. I hope you're not talking about me. <laughs> De you said decent following, so that must not be me. Um, yeah, sure. Sure. You know, like folks on here are trying to establish uh, some sort of brand and on YouTube it is incredibly popular to establish a very negative hateful brand and and once you decide a thing is bad and you find the folks who agree with you and support you in that you just double down every chance you get so I don't know who you're talking about because I don't follow really comic YouTubers <laughs> hardly at all with the exception of the ones that I you know have like really leaned into and know are good you know, that's why I have Ernie on here to talk about X-Men every now and again from Blurred Without Fear. I know he likes comics, genuinely. He <laughs> does a great job talking about them and breaking them down. Um, let's see, some other channels I think are good. Uh, for every kind of geek, a guy named Doug puts together, literally, I think, the best-looking videos and really good analysis. I run those essays on Comic Book Herald as well. Uh, Matt Draper, back when he used to talk about comics, doesn't so much anymore, but I think he does a great job. I think Comic Tropes does a really nice job. I think it's probably the biggest channel that I pay some attention to. Um, cartoonist kayfabe interviews can be really, really useful and interesting when I'm looking at, like, for example, like, I've, I've got this Ed Brubaker interview. You know, I went and watched him on Cartoonist kayfabe. It was a big, sprawling interview. That was interesting. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's kind of it. Like, I don't, I, that's the thing about, like, I, like, come on YouTube and, and able to expand Comic Herald and, and get to meet some of you and talk about comics that way. Um, but it's not really a platform I use a heck of a lot. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, Rob's comics explain, like, hey, more power to Rob, like, developed an enterprise, like, dude developed a, a flippin' empire in the YouTube game. I think anything I said, I don't think, like, I'm not crazy about comics explained videos, I'll be honest. Um, but anything I say is also just, like, drowning in the jealousy of wishing that I had done his thing circa 2015 and made myself a multimillionaire, <laughs> right? Like, just total honesty. Like, of course. Like, dude's killing it. So, you know, do his thing. Do his thing. Uh, I, I don't, I have no idea how he feels about the Krakow era. I guess if he's down on it, that would be a huge outsized influence being negative in the Krakow era. <laughs> you know, um, like, that would, that would definitely stand out. So if that's who you're thinking of, I could see that. But, I, you know, I think he tends to be uh, fair, and I don't doubt his passion, I guess. That's the thing, like, I can disagree with somebody about comics all night and day, and that's great, um, so long as I don't, like, as long as I'm not skeptical and cynical about, like, you don't even like comics, you know? Like, okay, like, you're just doing this for the, for the weird sort of culture war side of it, as opposed to, like, you know, like, no, I genuinely like comics, <laughs> and this one bothers me. Um, I've never thought that about Comics Explained. I think that's a, that's a guy who enjoys comics. Um, you know, good for him. 
Uh, oh, I'm seeing thinking critical mentioned here. Yeah, I I checked that one out way back when, like when I started, and I do not care <laughs> for that channel. Uh, I've seen some really, really crummy behavior from that channel. So yeah, I will call that out. If you're talking about them, um, not a fan. Not a fan. I think if you like my stuff, uh, thank you, and I appreciate that. Uh, if you're also watching their stuff, I do not understand how you see any overlap between the two of us. Uh, frankly, it, it bothers me that you might. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, up to all of you. Decide what you want to watch. Uh, yeah, I guess next week on the stream, we can just do a Dave Takes Down <laughs> all of the YouTube channels that uh, that he doesn't like. That's the thing, though, is like, I wouldn't know what they are at this point. Like, once you actually curate your algorithm a little bit, to sort of point to things that are, you know, acceptable and in your wheelhouse, you know, you stop seeing the garbage. You know, at least I do at this point. Uh, all right, I'm seeing final question here. Will you have a post-game report with Ernie next week? Uh, no, but I will have a post-game report about Axe Judgment Day and the Omega issue with Kieran Gillen. Uh, the post-game report will be with Kieran Gillen. Uh, again, it will be because of scheduling things. It'll be November 20th now. Uh, the Omega issue got pushed back. We were going to do it this weekend, actually, um, but the Omega issue got pushed back, and I was like, you know what? I don't want to, I don't want to do the interview before the Omega comes out, and then have the Omega come out and be like, and Karen Gillan launching Eternal Season Two. You know, like I wanted to have that news potentially out there and just like see what's actually in the comic. So we're doing it on November twentieth now, um, but that'll be super fun. That'll be interesting. Be a cool interview, and also like I'm interviewing Jam D. Mateus this week. Uh, this weekend, so I would have been trying to do J.M. Dimitrius and Kieran Gillen back-to-back -back days. That would have absolutely broken me. I think I'm partially broken as is, just having considered it for a while. Um, so I'm glad <laughs> that the schedule has, has allowed a little more uh, ability. And uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks so much for everybody for joining. I appreciate you. I appreciate you all listening. I appreciate some of the compliments I'm seeing here at the end. Uh, Dopesville, I'm seeing mentioned. Dopesville's good. Uh, I've watched Dopesville videos in the past and thought, this is somebody who's really good at this. Uh, so definitely, definitely appreciate the videos there. Uh, what do you think of your NBA team this year? Yeah, next week we're going to talk about it. Uh, but the Bulls? The Bulls rule. The Bulls rule. Still excited about the Bulls. I'm, I'm listen, six-seater bust. All right? Six-seater bust. Let's do it. All right, thanks everybody for joining. See you next week. Bye.